This week's Industry Spotlight, this is episode eight. Um, today we're gonna to cover Google versus Amazon. Um, Google's impending showdown with Amazon in terms of shopping, Twitter's breaking news feature, Instagram shoppable posts, and the Facebook data breach. So there's been a couple of announcements in re recent weeks from Google that suggest that they're, um, they're trying to infiltrate Amazon's space a little bit. They're trying to create a shopping marketplace similar to Amazon, so standing on the toes a little bit. Uh, where I think this comes from is a little bit off the success of the shopping campaigns that they've had in search. And obviously they've created a bit of an environment and a bit of a following over that uh, in recent years. And I think a couple of the product announcements in recent weeks with the Google Actions suggest that they're trying to create a similar ecosystem to Amazon in, in shopping. It's interesting that Amazon are working on their ad product and Google are working on the shopping proposition. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think they've, they've got a bit of catching up to do, but I think um, based on the results that they've, they've released, it suggests that shopping ads now drive more revenue than any other ad format in Google search. So obviously that works for advertisers and that works for them as well. Yeah, they've got the um, cart functionality where you can add multiple items from different retailers as well, haven't they? Yeah. So that's is that launched yet? I think so. Or it's, it's, it's gradual. Interesting try that. The shopping options is launched in the US, but it's yet to come to other markets. That's interesting though, because that's a leg up on Amazon really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, massively. I think, um, yeah, with the universal cart that they've tried creating as well, it is massively how does, direct uh, competition with, with Amazon, isn't how it? How does really? the fulfillment work with that then? So if you got a... It's a, it's a Google server checkout, from what I understand. I think what, they, you, you get your packages from each different retailer separate? I think so, but I think the overarching <coughs> goal uh, that they're trying to aim for is doing their own fulfillment yep. and their own logistics in the same fashion that Amazon do. So eventually, I'll imagine once they've developed the full logistics in the end-to-end -end that Amazon offer at the minute, I think that that's the overall goal, I think, with this. Cool. They're just trying to imitate the same thing. I mean, why wouldn't you? They've got the full um, marketplace down, haven't they, when it comes to retail of Amazon, so why wouldn't you want to leverage that? And it's I think the new um, yeah. Google Actions, which has been announced as well, which works in a similar way to what Amazon does with the, uh, basically, it's, it's a cost per sale, uh, model for advertisers and manufacturers so uh, essentially you won't have to spend too much money and getting your products to market like you do have to now as an advertiser on Google. Uh, Google will naturally promote uh, manufacturers who do a good job of fulfillment and things like that so that'll mean that that's organic reach um, on a cost per sale basis for anybody that uh, participates in the program. If Google can execute this well They've already got the infrastructure for things like reviews. They've got the, if they can do the fulfillment and the things that Amazon do really well, because they've got such a comprehensive ad product, I think they could win. Yeah, I believe so. I think the only thing that Amazon have got above of them is obviously the history. They've got the audience, haven't they? They've got the full end-to-end -end logistics that Google haven't got that are in development, I think. But it's gonna take a, a while to get that following and confidence from manufacturers as well. But I think that they're pretty much just trying to, you know, create the same same model out there, essentially off the back of the success that they've had, and the universal cart will just make it easier. But they'll have to do a hell of a lot of advertising, I think, to get that out there and get people to. I don't know whether they're expecting people to shift from Amazon to Google or just have both competing in that space. It'd be interesting how manufacturers and obviously suppliers uh, decide on the platform. I guess it's who, who's going to offer the most competitive rates, who's going to give them the best organic reach for the products. Mm. For a period of time, it might be invitation only, I would have thought, uh, on programs like that. And I, who knows how their algorithm in prioritizing um, you know, manufacturers and suppliers will be in contrast to 
Amazon, it'd be interesting to see how that how that works out and whether whether it'll actually be profitable for um, suppliers. I don't know. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is um, Twitter testing news to be the first thing that a user sees in the timeline. Um, this is an interesting move, and I think um, potentially something that has been triggered by Facebook releasing their breaking news or testing their breaking news feature. Um, the article that we're looking at on Digital Trends suspects that it's a sports-focused rollout initially, um, which would make sense given the fact that Twitter have partnered with people historically like uh, the NFL and things like that. Um, I think this kind of lends itself to Twitter's natural makeup being a breaking news sort of style site with trending hashtags and things like that. Um, so I don't think it's anything particularly new. Um, yeah, I think it probably um, connects with the whole clearing that you know having a tidy up of the publishers that everybody's all the big brands have been getting on social media publishers for about. I think they're just trying to probably tidy the landscape up a little bit mm. and make sure that they've, they've got a voice in that because you've not really heard much about Twitter, have you? Really, in all this, they've not really mm. been. Um, talked about negatively in any way. It might just be their response or them trying to you know, let people know that they are focusing on relevance as well and stuff that's newsworthy. Yeah, it seems like all the social networks have got some sort of play on this same thing now. I think you know, a human created news section. You know, Snapchat have got the news bit and then yeah, Facebook have got it and yeah, it seems logical that Twitter would have it too. Yeah. It's what people want to see, isn't it, really? I think that it is a good step towards giving people relevant news, you know, as, as they're waking up, getting the breaking news. I think it's that transition, isn't it, as well, from people who would naturally fire up the news app on, yeah. the, on the phone. Why, why bother when you can get a bit of, you know, social content from your peers combined with news as well? If it's all in yeah. one place, then you <clears> no need to really go to a news website. News apps aren't that popular anymore, are they? They used to be years ago. Seems like yeah, no one bothers anymore. They just rely on social. So if you can get some credible sources in there, and they're not just your mates spouting stuff, then yeah. Yeah. But why not get a combination of the two if you can on exactly. one, one platform? Yep. Uh, the next thing we're going to cover is Instagram expanding their shoppable organic posts. Um, they've rolled it out across eight more countries, including the UK, France, Italy, Germany, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Spain. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we've seen this floating about, it's not uh, relatively new. The rollout suggests that it is becoming quite successful. I think um, it's probably a good move. I think there's a risk of um, them potentially pissing people off um, and losing some attention. But it's a way of monetizing the platform. It's, it's kind of what social networks are all looking for. Um, it's also in sticking with Instagram's sort of unwritten rule of just not allowing links in posts, isn't it? It's just another way to essentially allow links in posts without yeah. actually putting text links on there. So it keeps, it keeps the interface clean and means you can't misclick onto dodgy links in posts and stuff like that, but also means that it's, it's contextually relevant in there. Yeah, if you, for, for, shop, for fashion and shopping and stuff like that, yeah. it's perfect, isn't it? I think it does a good job of maintaining what Instagram was built to be. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say, it's, it's tidy, it's not. It's not too um, intrusive. It's not got dirty links left, right, and centre. It's quite native experience in it, which is good. Mm -hmm. So I think they've done well to stay true to what they what they created in the first instance. I'd we'll have to see if there's any um, validation or anything on this. I mean, these links could go anywhere, right? Is there any validation to stop it going anywhere? Or the only ones that I've seen in the wild are people like in the in the style. The verified publishers. Oh, you've got to be verified within the set. Within the I can't post space. and put a link to the product. I don't believe so. Right. Um, but using in the style as an example, based on the fact that it's been, it's one of the only ones that I've seen. I think this is going to increase the value of influencers tenfold. It's an inf it's an influencer-led platform. It always has been. Brands have been partnering with influencers and Instagram for a long, long time. I think this legitimises them now monetizing the posts mm. um, so this is an interesting time for influencers especially with it being Instagram that's made this sort of leap I think this is something that will probably ripple throughout snapchat maybe Facebook um, 
I think it's a, it's a really strong move. Do you think it's going to improve like tracking and measurability for so like on a product level yeah. as well? So if a, if an influencer or a brand is pushing something out, you can then attribute exact sales to that post mm -hmm. and the, the products that they've also yeah, could that, add like a UTM product, exactly. couldn't you, on the link so the UTMs on it? Yeah, link it directly to the product page and then you've got your revenue attributed to that exact yep. product in, that's in the post. Imagine influencers though, charging 10 grand a post and then it generating 100 grand's worth of sales, they'll be like, yeah. Well, they can just charge yeah, we, nothing we, we and then charge that. commission now based with this, if they can put well, UTMs on it. There's loads different of models. models. Yeah. If you get a Kendall Jenner or yeah, Kim Kardashian though, it's just going to be like, right, give us a couple of million for a post and we'll prove to you how much money we can make. It'd be interesting yeah. to see what happens if the, like you say, like how the models will change, the, yeah. the pricing models and stuff, whether influencers will try and negotiate in like a, a revenue per model or something like that. It might inspire them to um, try different stuff as well in the post as well if they're trying to promote uh, an item that's maybe higher value or something like that. It might mix yeah. it up completely and might find them doing different creative stuff to sell those particular products harder, you don't know. I'd like to see a video use the same functionality. So for example, a catwalk model walking down a runway with the outfit on and each item being having a clickable link somehow. You could do that on YouTube, couldn't you, until recently? You could, couldn't you annotate stuff with links wherever you are in the video? I think so, but it might not be. Yeah, I think, I think you could do, couldn't you? Or was it just a, a link? It, it obviously didn't indicate what specific product you advertised I don't think. It's, I'm not sure. They've changed the rules recently. Though. The way in which the Instagram ones work, though, it's like you can click on the specific product within the image. Yeah, it's tagged like a person. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas on the YouTube, you could just have one annotation at the bottom, couldn't you? I think. No, I'm not sure. But yeah. Anyway, good move. Yeah, good. <laughs> good effort. We like it. Well played. So this last bit is probably one of the most widely covered pieces in tech over the last couple of weeks. It's to do with the uh, Facebook uh, data scandal with Cambridge Analytica. Um, so Zuckerberg's finally responded now. Um, he's got someone to House of Commons in the UK, that will happen, but yeah, that happened. And uh, he took out like loads of, he took out in paper, hasn't he, apologising? His, his quote is, we have a responsibility to protect your data and, if we can, then we don't deserve to serve you. I've been working to understand exactly what happened and how to make sure this does not happen again. Yeah, generic. Yeah, to be fair, it sounds like he's going to put loads of new policies in place. I mean, this article's on Market in Land that we've been reading and uh, promised loads of new policies. And uh, if he gets them all put in there, then, I mean, can't really do much else. He's uh, said he's going to ban people that misuse the platform and gathering data where they shouldn't be. So on a technical level, what are the restrictions exactly that he's, he's planning to impose? Stop apps, obviously, so one protecting of these data. He's basically saying that if you sign up to an app um, that asks for permissions to do something, and it's going to do something with your friends, they've also have got to have given consent to that app as well. Right. Okay. Um, which is quite a giant leap forward because that's going to basically just rule everyone out, isn't it? I mean, Why haven't they much. taken that step in the first place? Because they made 12 billion over the last mm -hmm. 10 years from people using this data. Right. Yeah, and it says they're going to get um, developers to sign, actually sign a contract, doesn't it, something somewhere in Yeah, the three points that are highlighted on the new restrictions are developers yeah. will lose access to other data if users haven't used the app in three months. The data an app can get when a user signs in is going to be limited to name, profile and email, so still pretty accessible. Developers will have to get approval and also sign a contract with Facebook in order to ask for users to their post or private data. Right. Mm. So it's basically just tightening everything up and just putting a bit more restrictions on what data they're going to allow third parties to see. Is it, yep. is it innocent? Is it as innocent as it comes across, do you think? Oh. Or, I think people uh, are overshooting over it a little bit. It's, it's naive to think that a company that has so much data and has an ad platform on the back end which drives most of their revenue is not going to use that data to their financial advantage. Yeah, I think it's a bit naive. I think but they didn't actually them, use it to the financial advantage in this case. No, but it wouldn't. Cambridge Analytica wouldn't have had access if Facebook didn't have it. No. But yeah. indirectly, yeah. they have still profited off that data going to Cambridge Analytica. Surely most people are aware by now that you know, 
social media platforms and anything that pretty much interacts with work who stores your data online now will be shared or sold off or something. So well, it's got to be pretty naive to think that that doesn't happen. I don't understand that though. I mean, there's a new thing that came out the other day that a few other tech publications picked up on today whereby if someone downloaded the zip of all the Facebook data, you know, you can do that now. Apparently, new privacy rules, you basically give me a zip of everything, it gives you literally everything. All right. Someone went through there and found like a call log. Uh, for all these calls between a certain couple of dates, and all these texts between a certain couple of dates, even though I'd never give consent to Facebook to look at these calls on really? text. So there's like other things that, you know. Stuff like that needs tightening up. Really. <laughs> I think for marketing purposes, the data that they're using is probably okay, but yeah, when you, when you get down to the nitty gritty, the stuff that they're recording gets a little bit dark. Yeah, yeah they denied that, that one. Um, but this, this guy, that, I mean, it's only on Twitter or something, I mean, it's been covered by a few publications. He swears that he never agreed to it and he never, uh, you know, let, let Messenger do his text or didn't always have that separate and stuff. So really, it should, should never happen, should it, bro? I think on the wider, wider conversation about data sharing and stuff, though, I think people get the backs up a little bit too easily about data and how it's used with Facebook. I mean, even from an advertising standpoint, I think people think once they're, when they're being targeted by ads, that are all of a sudden uh, relevant to them. They get suspicious mm. and they don't like it, but if you were to actually see the, uh, the targeting seg segments that you've got access to through Facebook's platform, it's all anonymous. You don't get any personal details or anything like that. It's just you're choosing from targeting segments where somebody's demonstrated some sort of interest in, you know, contextually or interacted with something that um, suggests that they're into something. I think people take it too far and think that you've got, you're choosing through, you know, you're looking at their email and the phone number when you, you're building out your targeting and stuff and it's completely anonymized. The same with when Gmail first started putting ads at the side and people were saying, oh, they're reading my emails. It's like, well, they're not really, are they? They're just keywords come up and then they target ads against those keywords. So it's, the publisher doesn't know what the contents of your emails are, the ad publishers, it's just, that's just how the algorithm works. What annoys me is people want the cake and they want to, they want to tweet it as, as well. It's like you, you put your email address in to a website, for example, into a form, because you want a free something, discount, piece of content, something for nothing. But mm. then when that data is used to ultimately make an ad experience better, people hate it. Like, don't put you. Don't be so naive as to to give your details away and give consent and then complain about it when it's used yeah. in a way. Yeah. Thing is, it's it's normally used in a really useful way yeah. as well. People are given the content that they're clearly interested in the browsing, so it's it's a it's a good experience for everybody. Nobody's trying to pull the wool over consumers' eyes. I think they're just. It's a lot, there's a lot of scaremongering that goes on in the industry, and I think people probably exaggerate how data is used and everything, but if you were to see it from an advertiser's standpoint, you know, using that data is completely protected, secured and anonymized in ways that obviously the general public don't really understand. It's just that a few needs to be emphasized more. The few bad people just tire for everyone else, don't they? Like when people get all the records stolen out of AWS, which we've talked about, and it's got driver's license, photocopies and stuff, it's like people get the backs up then, don't they? And just think that Yeah. You know, this is it. And I know you mentioned in specific free services like Gmail and Facebook are saying you know, people need to understand that if they're giving you details to these free services, they've got to monetize it. But then there's paid services where they, they'll set, they'll literally have sold the data on or they'll leaked it. Yeah. So uh, people just get the backs up, don't they? They know that worst case scenario, these, these things that are ridiculously bad do happen still. So people just sort of tire of the same brush, don't they, a little bit in that yeah. respect. It rocks the industry a little bit though because you get these anomalies that come out where, you know, accidents, we've never been here before, have we, really, in tech and, and advertising, the way data is shared, it's, it's new territory for everybody, so we're learning as we're going, and every now and again there's a little hiccup like this that occurs, but then it rocks the, the industry and there's things like, mm. obviously, people start putting more emphasis and education into GDPR and things like that, and, it, and then it rocks the whole industry again, I mean, is it going to get to a point where people don't want to share data at all and then there's you know it's killing an industry off if what do digital marketers do if there's no data to harness to but <laughs> like you've just said it's a, it's anonymized isn't it i don't think that it'll ever become a completely dead targeting set because people have got so much of an issue with you having their data what people need to understand as you correctly highlighted is the fact that it's it's anonymous 
Yeah, I know, but what I'm saying is when, when people, when thing, news um, pieces come out like this that scare people, people start thinking, oh, I'm not going to use Facebook anymore. Yeah. And then can you imagine if that, you know, that builds a bit of momentum and then everybody stops using it? And, you know, it's the, the marketing, digital marketing has taken a bit of a dive generally there. And what mm -hmm. happens, what happens then? You're, you're in a, a bit of a spiral, isn't it? People are always quick to criticise Facebook and s slur about what they're doing and give them a hard time because they're the biggest out there. It's like when WordPress gets a bad name for being insecure. It's just Microsoft Windows used to be getting hacked and virus, getting virus dispute every five minutes. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's the white, most widely platform. used platform, probably arguably online. It's going to get people criticising it. And I think people so. just need to just take it, take it up a bit, step back and focus on something a bit more important. It's yeah. still bad though. <laughs> yeah, it's still bad, but I think for everybody that criticises it and every article <clears throat> that comes out like this, you know, slating it, I think there has to be a counter-argument that puts it into context a little bit and says, you know, it, it's not a catastrophe. You know, it's not it's not the end of the world and this is how it works and you, you are still secure. The yeah. People just need reminding and reassurance that they are more secure than I think they think they are. Yeah, worse things have happened. Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> Thanks for watching, that's been episode 8 of Industry Spotlight. I uh, hope you enjoyed the topics. If you've got any ideas for future topics, let us know in the comments uh, or on social, at Thorn Digital, and we'll uh, get around some. Look at the blackboard, look at the blackboard. <laughs> and we'll get around some. All right, cheers. Bye. When we collide. Who said that? have branding in, mate. It's going to have to face that way, look. Oh, there's branding on fucking handle. They've nailed it. Whenever it's, it's in shop. <laughs> it branded on bottom as well? Yeah. God. China. You can have it, you've got to have it like that as well. So I'm rather not inside. We'll have to blur it out, so we'll do the marketing.